In the dark shadows, in the white cold, fearlessly we search for knowledge new and old. We drink the strong spirits and read the ancient tomes. The order of the Abracast, we are the brave and the bold. sacred months have passed slay the idolaters wherever ye find them and take them captive and besiege them and prepare for them each ambush but if they repent and establish worship and pay the poor due then leave their way free lo Allah is forgiving and merciful. This is the Quran. This is the sword verse. Chapter 9, verse 5. The Abracast. Occult, history, conspiracy, and violence. Welcome to the Abercast. I'm John Towers. We're going to be talking about one of my pet peeves tonight. And we will see, hopefully, why I am always trying to, I'm always striving to put these things into context. Sometimes I'm sure it might even get frustrating for you. Why I always say that context is the worst enemy for conspiracy theorists. We're going to be talking about 9-11 today. We're actually going to be talking about 9-11 all week. <laughs> and uh, even though 9-11 is one of those huge, you know, world-changing, history-altering events, we're going to be struggling to put 9-11 in context. So this is maddening. Um, this is the maddening thing about 9-11 conspiracy theories. We get like 10 minutes into it and someone says, quote, you know, you got to be an idiot to think 19 guys with box cutters did this, unquote. Or, quote, like, an hour after the towers fell, bro, the government just suddenly knew Osama bin Laden did it. No one had ever even heard of that guy before, unquote. And what follows the three probably three plus hours of show that follows this week is my reply to this. I think this is going to be over three hours long. So obviously I'm not going to be talking about micro nuclear ex explosives hidden in the buildings or invisible energy weapons or that there were wizards involved who knocked the two towers down to make one tower as a, ritual invoking transgenderism um, or any, any of that silliness. We're going to be talking about real history. We're going to be talking about real geopolitics and we're going to be talking about, well, politics and religion. So if you're the type of dude that needs a trigger warning, that was, that was fucking it. You're, <laughs> you're in for a wild ride, but if you're interested, Put your seatbelt on, grab your vessel of the art, pour your weapon of mass distraction, you know, whatever your weapon of mass distraction happens to be. Mine is a uh, gin jihad here. And 
as is especially appropriate for this evening. And it's going to be a bumpy ride. We're going to start the history of 9-11, rightly so, on uh, 9-11, September 11th, 1683. We have detailed on the show Muslim expansion. After Mohammed dies, the Muslims pushed out and went through this time of rapid expansion. And eventually there was a string of caliphates and so forth. And we eventually end up with the Ottoman Empire. One of the things that well, one of the areas or one of the regions that these Muslims always sought to conquer and to take was what they called the golden apple of Europe. It was Vienna. The city had been attacked and sieged by the religion of peace many times over the centuries, but this time was different. The Ottomans were determined and they took time making plans and preparations and they built up the inner the infrastructure widening roads, fixing and reinforcing bridges and establishing a supply chain to move feed and supply the massive force they used to surround the walled city. On July 14th, the siege started. 140,000 Ottoman troops surrounded the city and demanded the city to surrender. But what you need to know is that the dude in charge of the defense of the city was this guy, Count Ernest Ernst Rudiger von Stromberg. He, you look at illustrations of him, like portraits of him, and he looks like kind of a bit of a dandy, but he was a badass. Uh, in my mind, he was, a, he was like Lando Calrissian, you know, with a cape, but he had like this little hand, this little thin handlebar mustache, and you could just see him going like, well, 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 what do we have here? You know, as he cracks open a Colt 45. Anyways, <laughs> they demanded that the city surrender. The Ottomans demanded that the city surrender, and they offered sort of terms for peace, saying that basically no one had to convert. They would just get taxed more, and they would get to keep all their stuff. You know, you might remember this as the jizya. Uh, they were subjugated and taxed and sort of took this second-class status. However, von Stromberg told them to go and fuck yourself. Those probably weren't his actual words. Uh, he had only 15,000 soldiers and like 5,000 volunteers and around 370 cannons. But this wall, the walled city he was defending was huge. The major motivator in von Stromberg's stubbornness was that the Ottomans took a city just to the south of Vienna a few days earlier, and that city, when presented with the demands of surrender, they gave up. And, well, the Muslims didn't enslave or kill anyone. It was great. It was a peaceful day. Everyone was happy. There was cotton candies, uh, hot dogs, and bouncy castles for the kids. I'm just kidding. Uh, the city surrendered and everyone was enslaved and slaughtered anyways. So the siege began and the Ottomans sent in sappers to mine under the walls. Von Stromberg and his soldiers countered this brilliantly, in my opinion, by tunneling under the walls themselves and intercepting the Ottomans tunnels. I wrote a I wrote a book about this. It was a short book. Okay, it was a comic book, but it was called Vienna 1683. Um, it's out there. And um, this part of the story always fascinated me. When I was in the Army, I was a combat engineer, and the idea of this tunnel warfare was really cool to me. Anyhow, uh, eventually a relief force was on its way to rescue Vienna led by the king of Poland, Jan Sobieski III. He had 47,000 Germans and 27,000 Poles. I was going to say Polacks. I don't think that's the right. But we'll just call we'll just rust on Poles. Sobieski sent his force on the uh, the plains to the east and he lined up 18,000 horsemen and Sobieski led uh, 3,000 of his winged hussars. 
And you're probably like, what the fuck is a winged hussar? Well, here we go. I'm gonna, I'll tell you about it. Winged hussars are these great, uh, heavy shock troop cavalrymen. These guys were the elite Polish horsemen, Polak horsemen, Pole horsemen. I don't know. On their armor, they had these huge wings attached to their armor with like these uh, eagle feathers and ostrich feathers. So imagine this Sobieski on the front or Sobieski in front of his hussars, and he led the largest cavalry charge in history into the Ottoman line. Imagine watching thousands of these hem heavily armored, huge, you know, Eastern European dudes on these war horses with these wings, lances and swords rushing towards you. When these hussars got to the line, they crushed it. They just devastated this line and due to the ass whipping they got in this tunnel warfare and just being raped figuratively by Sobieski and the Hussars, the um, Ottomans were just massacred afterwards. Sobieski says of the battle quote, I came, I saw and God conquered unquote. So, It is true that the Ottoman Empire limped along till 1922 or 23, but some historians mark Vienna 1683 as the event that started the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. This was the blow that the empire could never recover from, the downfall of the caliphates, September 11, 1683. So if you're interested in this timeline that I'm about to run down, uh, I would suggest you sign into the mailing list, the degree of the Fulgore Correspondentia. I spent a lot of time translating all this information into an infographic, um, and you can get it there. It's got, a, it's got a lot of these points in that I'm about to run through probably for like the rest of this episode. So let's get into it. 1886, the fucking automobile was born. 1903, the first official sustained controlled flight, the Kitty Hawk, the Wright brothers. There was actually, you know, there was actually a German guy named Gustav Whitehead in Pittsburgh that flew in 1899. He had a sustained flight in 1899, but this is the quote official account. 1916, the first tank was used in combat. This was the Battle of the Psalms, which we covered some time ago uh, on the on the show. 1926, an English engineer, A.A. A. Griffith, publishes a paper on compressors and turbines in which he basically invents the jet engine. It took a couple of years to actually build one, but this is the dude who did it right here. What does this have to do with 9-11? This is it. This is, I'm documenting the world being, becoming driven by petrofuel, which is basically the reason this section of the world becomes relevant globally. Right. 1938, Daman well, number seven in Saudi Arabia was drilled into and what would soon be identified as the largest source of petroleum in the world. This discovery, as we will see, or as, I mean, we already know, changed the political reality of Saudi Arabia, the Middle East, and the whole world. February 20th, 1945, on the way back from the Yalta Convention, Democrat President Franklin Delano Roosevelt meets with Saudi, Pre Saudi President Abdul Aziz. And they strike an agreement for the U.S. to get preferential treatment in oil for protection. Think blood for oil. <laughs> this is it. It stretches all the way back to a Democrat in 1945. FDR says, yes, I agree to this from his wheelchair. 1950 airliners are produced. 
1957, Osama bin Laden was born. Uh, Bin Laden's dad was a wealthy business owner. He was in construction. Uh, Islamic law states that you can have four wives if you can provide for them. So since this guy was rich, he had four wives all the time, but he would divorce them and marry new ones. It was like a rotate, like a lazy Susan of wives. Anyhow, Osama's mom was a feisty Syrian. um, And his father called her the slave, you know, that's a cute pet name. And Osama was known as the son of the slave. You know, that's adorbs. I'm sure that didn't have any psychological impact on him, by the way, at all in, uh, 67, ironically, uh, Osama bin Laden's father was killed in a plane crash. The pilot was an American. I'm sure that didn't have any impact at all on him either. 1973, the construction of the World Trade Center is completed. In 1978, the People's Democratic Party, you know, if you ever hear that, the People's Democratic Party of yada, 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 they're communists. So the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan seizes power and a civil war ensues between these commies, these pinko commies and these Muslim freedom fighters. And these Muslim freedom fighters go on to become the Mujahideen, their guerrilla fighters. 1978, the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan seize power and a civil war ensues between these commie motherfuckers and the, mu- and the Muslims. These Muslim freedom fighters, the Mujahideen. Eventually, the Soviets got involved to back up these communist people's democratic party, yada, yada, whatever's they sent troops and tanks and helicopters. 1979, uh, the camp David Accord were the president of Egypt and war Sadat and the Israeli prime minister sign a treaty. The Egyptian president agrees to recognize Israel's right to exist. Put a pin in that. We're going to get back to it. And this drove the Middle East Muslims crazy. With the help of Jimmy Carter, Iran was thrown into turmoil when the Shah was overthrown by the radical Islamic leader Ayatollah Khomeini when he took over. To these guerrilla fighters, this sort of shows the world and sort of themselves that they can overthrow a government. And I'm sure they look back at this as like some kind of golden age and to the rest of the world. It's a time of like piss and fire. You might be asking me, Hey John, what does this, what do you mean by that? And I'm not going to get into the whole thing, but if you want to see the best modern example of how backwards and regressive Islam is just Do an image search on Iran before and after the revolution. Iran used to be like America. They used to actually call it the West of the Middle East or something like, or the America of the Middle East or something like that. These hot chicks were walking around in mini skirts and fucking dancing and having fun. Not anymore. Eh. (laughs) What? What? (laughs) <laughs> tablecloths for you, tablecloth, pick tablecloths for you, tablecloths for you. 1979, there was a major terror thing where these terrorists took the Grand Mosque for a few weeks. Uh, in 1981, finally, we're going to get some, we're going to get some sense into this. We're going to inject. <laughs> we're going to inject some sense into this whole fucking situation. Sense and a bunch of movie references. So Reagan's first term, 1981, he looks at Afghanistan and he thinks correctly. So that this situation could be the Soviets version of Vietnam and the U S starts to support the Mujahideen. Think of Rambo three. This is the reason Rambo three was in Afghanistan. John Rambo was a disgruntled Vietnam vet and Afghanistan was a mirror to Vietnam. Global politics shift. Our interests usually stay the same. Our our economy is intricately linked to oil. 
but we are going to see that the geopolitical landscape shifts constantly. So here's a point of a problem I have with the conspiracy folks. Often they are quick to point out that the Mujahideen and the Taliban and Osama bin Laden had ties to our uh, intelligence gathering agencies. Osama bin Laden had worked with the CIA and now he's fighting us. Yes, that's proof that it's an inside job or something. Well, that's the way the world works. And rightly so. We both had a common enemy. We were both fighting the communists. If Osama bin Laden did work with the CIA, do you think it was for the American way of life? If you think that you're fucked. Back to Rambo 3, John J. Rambo was working with the Mujahideen for politics. It was not his personal baggage. It wasn't like Rambo was there working with the Mujahideen because he had found Islam in the federal penitentiary. He wasn't. He didn't... He didn't convert, he didn't convert to Islam. <laughs> he was there for political re he was there for political reasons. He was fighting communists. Do um not to add another movie thing, but think of it as this, The Return of the Jedi. The Muslims were we'll just say the Muslims were symbolized by these little Ewoks and John Rambo was Luke Skywalker. And he was there to fight the empire. And he was getting help, and he was helping the Ewoks. Do you think that Luke Skywalker stopped to worry or care about what weird god the, Eloc the Ewoks worshipped? Apparently, it looked just like C-3PO. <laughs> Anyways, maybe this is the whole political meaning of Return of the Jedi, I don't know. Or do you think that Luke, Han, and Leo worried about the political implications of involving the Ewoks in their, their battle of Endor? Here's an interesting idea. What if the, uh, after the end of the Battle of Endor, the Ewoks turned their cute little viciousness into a radical sort of ideology and some years down the road did a 9-11 style uh, attack on the, pla the planet of Coruscant? That's a good one. I mean, let's, let's follow that fucking thread. J.J. <laughs> Abrams, listen to this. Anyways, alliances are loosely threaded and will change and have changed and certainly did change when major parts of the environment change. Like, spoiler alert, when the Mujahideen won and the Soviets pulled out of Afghanistan, that shit changed everything. In 81, Anwar Sadat, the president of Egypt, the signor of the Camp David Accords gets a fatwa issued against him. And he was assassinated during an annual victory parade. Kali Uzmabali, a lieutenant in the Egyptian army, stood up and sprayed Sadat with his Kalishnikov. Put a pin in this. This will come back later. After the assassination, over 300 of these Muslim Brotherhood types of fucking characters got locked up. They threw them all in this massive cage, or maybe it was like a collect, like a stack of cages. You could see them in these videos. It's like this long wall of cages and all these sweaty, miserable fucks are all like leaning against the bars, yelling and screaming, blah, 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 at each other. Uh, so all of this stuff is sort of background, but this is where the seed of 9-11 is actually planted because behind this cage are a couple of key figures. There's Dr. Al Zwahari, who is the future, the future leader of Al Qaeda and the future surgeon of one Osama bin Laden. And this other character, the blind Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman. He was the leader of another Islamic militant group. We're going to be hearing a lot more about this motherfucker. Al-Zwahari is an English speaker, and he's screaming at the press that is there filming all these sons of bitches. He's yelling in English, by the way. He's not yelling in Arabic or whatever. Like, he's yelling for the world to hear him. He's yelling about establishing an Islamic state and all this. He's saying... 
this is not factual. This is just, <laughs> this is editorializing. He's yelling, "What do we want?" To enslave people and murder infidels. And when do we want it? We want it now. There were five death sentences in the wake of this Sadat assassination. Al Zwahari is let go after three years in an Egyptian prison where he was tortured and wound up giving a bunch of his fucking boys up. Uh, the blind Sheikh got out of prison too. They had a hearing in his defense lawyer or whatever. Check out this reason they let him out of prison. Basically, they let him out of prison because this guy's blind. <laughs> What's he going to do? What kind of trouble could he cause? Because he's blind. <laughs> so they let him out. And as soon as he's out, he runs to Jordan and eventually winds up in a... <laughs> He officially winds up in Brooklyn preaching jihad. This is a crazy story. So this is also another thing we need to keep in our brains as we're going through this. Because um, this is going to figure into the story. How did this motherfucker wind up in Brooklyn, New York? Anyhow, let's talk a little bit about the blind shake. This guy, sheesh. He looks like a fucking comic book villain, by the way. Well, not modern comic books, because, you know, we all know Muslims in modern comic books are always the good guy. <laughs> There's no bad guy Muslim <laughs> comic book characters. But um, classically, uh, he wears the Santa Claus hat and these br Blues Brothers Ray Bans. He's got this crusty beard, and his lips are always like dried out. And when you see him uh, with these Blues bro Brothers glasses, and he's got like this one white eye that rolls around dryly in its socket, it's fucking disgusting. But he doesn't have a good story. You know, when you see his villainous ass or hear his name, you think, oh man. <laughs> what if he blew his eyes out by trying to make a bomb or maybe he took a Soviet RPG to the face in Afghanistan, or maybe he was preaching so hard. He went blind or something. Allah made him blind. I don't know. Really. He just went blind because he had type two diabetes. <laughs> so, um, I, I gotta get back to the script. Okay. 1984 Brooklyn. The Al Farouk Mosque was established and mainly used to radicalize Muslims and send them to Afghanistan to jihad against the communists. So it's a recruitment tool and a fundraising center. 85, the service office, which oversees operations uh, and a training center for the Mujahideen start receiving training materials. These training materials uh, were translated U S army and special forces operation training manuals. Well, this is weird, right? They found this dude, Ali Muhammad, uh, who was stationed at Fort Bragg, and he was supplying these guys with his training material from the JFK Special Warfare Center and school. Basically, it was this guy was he was creating an encyclopedia of jihad. He got together all of these army manuals and started compiling and translating them. So Ali Muhammad enlisted when he was 34 years old. He was a sergeant at the time. You don't enlist in the army when you're 34 years old. I, I don't know what the limit is, but that's old. Uh, um, but here there is an actual other side of it. He was a major in the Egyptian special forces. He was in the unit that actually killed Sadat. How does he find his way here? Why doesn't the military background check pick this up for a prior military record in a do in a dubious past? So I'm going to ask you that question and then I'm going to tell you an interesting story on the other side. Learn more at abracast.com. Get bonus content, 
by signing up for the mailing list. Get all that plus many exclusive episodes by supporting the show at patreon.com or subscribestar.com. So you might be like, what are these background checks all about? Like how, whatever can they be? And this is what I'm saying. When I was in basic training, my drill sergeants called a kid out. They asked if anyone in our families were high ranking military. And they called this kid out because he didn't raise his hand. And they had already known that uh, they, meaning someone in Army Intelligence, I suppose, had discovered that this kid's dad or his grandfather was a general in North Viet- in the North Vietnamese Army. Um, nothing happened to the guy, so you know. Uh, they should have just been able to figure out that this 34 year old Egyptian was an officer in the Egyptian special forces, right? They couldn't figure out that guy's bullshit. I don't know. Uh, this is the first instance of a term that we are going to hear ad nauseum from this point on until we stop talking about nine 11. And that term is bureaucratic incompetence. Now this how was this dude able to get here? Bureaucratic incompetence. How was this guy able to get into the army? Bureaucratic incompetence. How was this dude in special forces, or at least how did he have access to the training manuals in the JFK Special Operations Warfare Center and school? Bureaucratic incompetence. Remember, this is before the army manuals were published online, right? This is back before online. This is back before the internet. The later uh, it comes out that this guy's supervisors would write memos to Army Intelligence voicing their suspicions that something was fishy with this dude. They suspected that he was leaking all this classified information. And no one ever cared. No one ever investigated. Why? CIA, I guess, maybe FBI. Maybe it was bureaucratic incompetence. Uh, this guy's unit commander would brief army intelligence and nothing would ever happen. And he would later say, quote, I guess CIA dot, 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 unquote. So when you think about how much these manuals and these materials could uh, be teaching, you know, what the special forces training is all about. So unconventional warfare is about, well, for, okay, so special forces training is all about training in uh, indigenous folks, right? So training, you know, you speaking their language and you training them. This is an, what happened ultimately was an inversion of that. Like they sent a bunch of Saudis over here to be taught by Americans to fly plane straight and level. You know what I mean? That's weird. But on top of that, they also teach kidnapping, assassination, and uh, hijacking aircraft. But more than that, they are instilling these ideas, the five pillars of special operation forces. Not all of these apply, but stick with me. Humans are more important than hardware. 19 dudes with box cutters. Quality is better than quantity. Only 19 dudes. <laughs> special operation forces cannot be mass produced. Well, yeah, okay. Competent special operation forces cannot be created after emergencies occur. They can only be <laughs> made before, I guess. They're the ones that are making these emergencies occur, I suppose, I guess is the implication. Most special operation forces require non-special force operation support. We're going to see a lot of this play into our story moving forward this week. So, well, uh, okay, let's just take a look at these. Look at these principles and ultimately what happened on 9-11. Humans are more important than hardware. Strip this down. A box cutter is, eh, 
It's just a box cutter. It isn't a Claymore mine. Is it an AK-47? It's just a box cutter. And a box cutter in the right hands of the right motherfuckers. 19 box cutter motherfuckers. Well, we know what can happen. Special operation forces cannot be mass produced. We'll just let that one go. Competent special operation forces cannot be created after emergencies. Because they are the emergency. I don't know if that's part of the pillar. I might have just made that up. Most special forces operations require non-special operations support. This is true with the 9-11 guys. They had handlers. They had pay people. They had flying instructors and all of that stuff. Uh, this is a giant part of the puzzle that is falling into place. It turns out that al Zawahari has sent Ali Muhammad to the States to infiltrate the, the military. He had uh, applied to the FBI. He actually, you're not even going to believe this. He worked briefly for the CIA and eventually enlisted in the army at 34 years old. That's outside army standards, I believe, but whatever it's late. Back to our timeline. 1987, Berlin, Ronald Reagan famously tells Gorbachev, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall, which was like the stone cold stunner of the Cold War. If the Cold War was 1990s attitude era WWF wrestling match. At the same time, Reagan is sending Stinger missiles to the Mujahideen, allowing them to blast tanks and aircrafts out of the sky. 1989, Soviets pack up and leave Afghanistan, and the regional politics of the Middle East changes forever, bro. I think a lot of these guys thought that the, when they won, they would be welcomed into the U.S. and set up with property like a, like fucking like my blue heaven or something. I think that they might <laughs> have been sort of this thought that the Mujahideen, they were helping the U S by fighting the Soviets. But in the end, this U S was like, no dog, we were helping you fight the Soviets. You pat them on the, pat them on the head and be like, Oh, see you later, bros. So when the commies left, there was no reason for us to stick around the, um, and we left too, leaving a war torn country filled with refugees and burning shit everywhere. I'm not saying it was specifically in our purview to deal with all of that stuff. Everyone left the beautiful, picturesque <laughs> Afghanistan, and these guys, the Mujahideen, uh, victorious, heroic freedom, freedom fighters fighting against the oppression of communism, won. And they just kind of looked around and were like, well, we're pretty good fighters and we got all these guns. What do we do now? More on this a little later. 1990, the Soviet Union crumbles. The Cold War is over. The geopolitical landscape changes forever. I think it was HW. I think uh, he sums it up pretty good. Uh, President George H.W. Bush expressed his emotions. The biggest thing that had happened to the world in my life, in our lives, in this, by the grace of God, America won the Cold War. And meanwhile, back in Brooklyn, under the facade of this innocent looking mosque, law enforcement is notified that the Al Farouk mosque is buying thousands of rounds of ammo a month. Truckloads of these parishioners or whatever of the mosques would go to the Calvert gun range every month and do firearms training. The FBI would follow them and surveil them and take pictures of them. All the guns, uh, I guess were properly registered and so forth. One of these dudes, Syed Nosser, uh, disguised as an Orthodox Jew, walks up to this firebrand rabbi, My Meir Kahani, uh, who was giving a speech in um, the New York Marriott East Side. This guy speaks out very loudly against Palestine. And he was the founder of the Jewish Defense League, 
league. Anyways, Nocer walks up and he blasts this rabbi point blank range. Bam, bam, bam. Shot him in the neck. Kahani uh, would later die from his wound. Okay, so it wasn't bam, bam, bam. It was just one bam, but later, whatever. He shot him in the fucking neck. Um, there was a shootout with the postal cop. This guy was trying to flee, but he wound up getting arrested. I think he got shot and arrested. In 2002, Eleanor Hill, who was the director of the Senate Intelligence Committee investigating the massive amounts of intelligence failures prior to 9-11, or as we now call them, quote, bureaucratic incompetence, unquote, reported that this dude had clear ties with the terrorist organization in Pakistan through the Al Farouk Mosque in Brooklyn, and that Osama bin Laden helped pay for this guy's legal defense. At the trial, he was found not guilty of the murder of Kahani, which is amazing. Despite the room full of witnesses and the people who were around to see the gunfight that ensued afterwards, the judge said, quote, This verdict is against an overwhelming weight of evidence and devoid of common sense, unquote. And he eventually got a few years in prison for the gun charge. I think he was sentenced to 22 years, but I think he only served like seven, I think. So what's next? Nineteen ninety, Saddam Hussein, a member of the Ba'athist Party, who actually has actual links to national the National Socialist Party of Germany, the Ba'athist Party, who actually has links to Nazis. <laughs> and the Iraq military in, uh, invade Kuwait. Saudi Arabia feels threatened. So Iraq borders Kuwait, Kuwait borders Saudi Arabia in under the, uh, I'm just going to, so bin Laden meets with the Saudis and he says, Hey guys, I got my Mujahideen motherfuckers right here. We got muscles. We got guns. We got experience and stuff. And we just got done beating the fucking Soviets. Why don't you let us come here and we will fight the Iraqis for you? And the Saudis do not take him seriously at all. So let's tie some of this rambling together because of an agreement from the 40s that we have talked about. We are tied to Saudi Arabia through a preferential oil agreement where we get certain oil perks from them, but we have to defend them. So hostile forces invade Kuwait. Actually, the fourth largest army in the world invades Kuwait. Kuwait shares a border with Saudi Arabia, so we must act. This is from, I mean, this is from FDR. This is actually reinforced in the Carter era. The blind sheikh shows up in Brooklyn and the, you know, you guessed it, the Al Farouk Mosque. Uh, do you know how this fucking guy gets into the country? You guessed it. You guessed it, everybody. Bureaucratic incompetence. Or maybe it was payment for a job well done. So the biggest problem about this blind shake being here at the time is that he lends credibility to these motherfuckers. Because he's a legit, respected Islamic scholar. So law enforcement is over this, and they start to see the connections everywhere. The blind sheik in al Zawahiri is connected to the Sadat assassination. Ali Muhammad is also linked to the Sadat assassination. And the Egyptian Special Forces, which is connected to the Mujahideen. And he is connected to the gun training at the... Uh, truckloads of Muslims from the Al Farouk Mosque. And Nosair was at the Al Farouk Mosque gun range. His legal defense bills were paid by bin Laden. The FBI, I mean, literally, it's all right there. The FBI uh, take this Egyptian guy named Ahmed Salam who is great. If you get the, if you can find the interviews with this guy, he is 
awesome. He was in the Egyptian army, uh, but he was on the side of Sadat. So he was one of Sadat loyal to, he was a loyalist of Sadat. And when the shit hit the fan, he took off to America. So the FBI put Salam uh, in as an informant. He would just hang out at the protest uh, on the side of Nocer's trial and eventually meets Nocer's uncle, this guy named Al Jabroni. <laughs> and, uh, like I've already mentioned, the, I've already mentioned Russell wrestling once or twice, but here we go. This guy's actual name is Al Jabroni. And Al Jabroni is going back and forth to Pakistan to meet with Bin Laden for money for the defense of this guy who killed this rabbi. Salam eventually worked his way into the blind shake circle and sold himself as like this bomb maker. So everything is crystallizing here. Financing Bin Laden and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed training Ali Muhammad, the Saudi connection. Since our military is still in Saudi Arabia, folks there are starting to feel like they are being occupied. So this leads to the radicalization and Recruitment, Wahhabist, Jihadist, Legitimacy, the Blind Sheikh. And we can see sort of the beginnings of the blueprint right here for some nasty business. Salam is asked to build 12 pipe bombs. The FBI wants Salam to wear a wire, and he won't because he still has family in Egypt. And he's worried about them keeping their heads attached to their fucking bodies. The FBI, instead of working with this guy in order to keep one hand on the wheel, fires the dude. He, they just fire him. It's a small case of bureaucratic incompetence. <laughs> so while Salam is away, a shifty son of a gun named Ramsey Youssef shows up and he's like, yo, bros, screw the 12 pipe bombs. I'm going to build one big bomb. And everyone's like, for real, son? And he was like, yeah, for real. I'm going to build one big bomb. February 26, 1993, a truck entered the lower level or parking level of the North Tower of the World Trade Center. The plan was to blow the core of one of the towers and have it fall and crush the other tower. Well, they didn't know that the World Trade Center were built without or with minimal core support. The sturdy outside structure, the outside walls are what actually held the towers together. We're going to talk about this very much in later episodes. The one hundred, the one thousand three hundred and ten pound urea nitrate hydrogen gas enhanced bomb exploded, opening a hundred foot wide hole in the four sub levels of concrete. Six people lost their lives, and a hundred, uh, one thousand forty two people were injured. Ramsey Youssef fled to Pakistan on March fourth. Mohammed A. Salama got caught. He reported the rental truck stolen and went back to the rider truck rental place to get his deposit back. The FBI was there waiting for him. They had gotten the VIN number off the truck of the rear axle, which had been driven into the concrete at the blast site. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed found some of Ramsey Youssef's plans and soon there would be sort of this perfect storm. Funding, plans, and a chance to change the world. Thank you very much for listening to the show. I'm John Towers, and this has been the Abercast. And stay tuned for two more parts of 9-11 in Context. Learn more at abracast.com. Get bonus content by signing up for the mailing list. 
Get all that plus many exclusive episodes by supporting the show at patreon.com or subscribestar.com. Uh, we are continuing our examination of the events of 9-11 and putting them in historical context. One reason we are doing these episodes are that 9-11 truthers are one of my pet peeves. So if you are tuning in to hear about micro atomic explosions or energy weapons or inside jobs or magic rituals designed to punch a hole into another dimension or whatever, a moon base with invisible lasers, this might not be the episode for you. I hope you stay and listen, but I don't mind if you go. Uh, I was talking to a truther, and one of the things that you hear over and over again is, I can't believe that you just think that 19 dudes grabbed box cutters and did this. So ultimately, this little series, putting 9-11 in context, um, little series, it's going to be over three hours long, I'm pretty sure. And most of those three hours are unpacking the word, quote, just unquote, in the previous sentence. No, I don't think that just 19 guys grabbed box cutters and did this. I don't even think that only 19 guys with backing of an extensive terror network with multiple cells headed by Osama bin Laden did this. And when I get done with this, we are going to see, like we saw a little bit in the last episode, that there were people in our government, intelligence people, law enforcement people, highly ranked, appointed political people, and even elected officials that have blood that was spilled on 9-11 on their hands. And uh, don't even get me fucking started. I don't want to hear how fire doesn't melt steel, okay? Fire melts steel. That's how we have horseshoes. <laughs> That's how we have swords. They have whole shows on the History Channel about how fire melts steel. Anyhow, it doesn't even need to melt it. It just needs to bend it with the weight of, I don't know, the tallest building in New York and gravity. <laughs> explosive <laughs> combat engineer stuff. You know, uh, if you don't think fire can melt steel, you know, you've never seen those shows on, on history channel or just never thought about it. The, um, if you heat steel enough, it doesn't have to melt. It just bends. It doesn't, it happens all the time. It's just like that on a much larger scale. So, Oh, I feel like I'm getting, I'm amped up already. I'm getting, <laughs> getting off page. Um, so if you're playing along at home, this is the point where I would like to invite you to summon your vessel of the art. Mix up your favorite weapon of mass distraction right tonight. Of course, I am rolling with the, G the Jin Jihad because it's thematic. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to raise a toast to all uh, my Patreon and Subscribe Star um, supporters. Thank you guys very much. Without you, none of this would be made possible. Here, here. Okay, let's do it. Let's get into it. You know, if you're taking, if you're taking science lessons, uh, 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 civics lessons and history lessons from kids that are in the ninth grade on a fucking YouTube video, <laughs> you need to reevaluate yourself, bro. Okay. I'll, that's it. I'm done now. I'm sorry. <laughs> Instead, take it from a podcaster <laughs> who's not a kid, by the way. I'm not, I haven't been in ninth grade for a long time. Um, okay. Last episode. We started tracking this long chain of events from uh, 1683, um, where the first 9-11 happened when the Ottoman Empire was defeated at the walls of Vienna, a crushing defeat at the walls of Vienna by this Polish king, Jan Sobieski III, and the flying hussars. We talked about Afghanistan and the eventual defeat of the Soviets. And the fall of Russia. <laughs> Not the fall of Russia. The fall of the Soviet Union. We talked about Desert Storm and finally the World Trade Center bombing in 
we ended the episode by talking about this sort of perfect storm in the wake of the World Trade Center bombing. We have uh, financing provided by Osama bin Laden in the Al Farouk Mosque uh, in Brooklyn. Fundraising efforts. We have this uh, colleague, Sheikh Mohammed, sort of uh, inherited Ramsey Youssef's Wiley Coyote, super genius, like mastermind book of uh, plans. And they had these training resources with Ali Muhammad uh, translating special forces manual. Uh, right out of Fort Bragg and leaking them to the Mujahideen. Um, there was a recruitment opportunity and resources available. Um, an occupying force in Saudi Arabia, where I think, I think nineteen, I think the nineteen hijackers actually came from there. We, uh, in bittering the people over there. Uh, also, there was the religious legitimacy to the whole endeavor provided by the blind sheikh. Even after he was arrested, he was advocating jihad and all of this nonsense. Um, they didn't kill him like they should have. They just locked him up. So after the bombing in 93, these dudes were off to the races. They manufactured five 1,500-pound um, bombs, and they started planning what was called the Day of Terror event, where they were going to blow up the Holland Tunnel, and they were going to blow up the Lincoln Tunnel, and they were going to blow up the Washington Bridge. This is like what Bane did in that last Batman movie. <laughs> uh, they were going to blow up the UN in which, I mean, I'm not even sure if that's even a bad idea. I mean, I think that I might be able to get behind that. Um, they were going to blow up the FBI building in Manhattan. All five bombs were going to go off simultaneously cutting any escape out of Manhattan and thousands of people would have just drowned in the tunnels alone. And we're not even talking about the people that would fall off the bridges and like any of that, <laughs> any stuff like that. Law enforcement focuses on the blind shake because he's out there radicalizing believers. Uh, there was like a law and order, like law and order did a TV movie. I think unless I got my wires crossed uh, in Mr. Big from Sex in the City was in it as his Law and Order character. I think maybe I'm confusing two things. Anyhow, there's like like a, there's a TV movie about this about the them catching and focusing on the blind shake. Mm -hmm. uh, because he's part of the puzzle. He's the part of the puzzle that gives these guys religious le legitimacy because he's an actual Islamic scholar. You know he's. <laughs> like a weird fucking like comic book villain. He wears this Santa Claus hat and blues brothers, Ray bands. But, uh, he, the, the, his thing with his eye, if he takes the sunglasses off, he's just got like his one eye is just this fucking like gnarly marble, like eye, like rolling around dryly in its socket. It's so fucking gross. Um, and he doesn't even have a good story. It's not like he got acid splashed on his face or uh, he was constructing a bomb that blew up on him, you know, or like caught an RPG, like a Russian RPG to the face. It's not anything like that. He just had like childhood diabetes and went blind. So I don't know. I guess uh, they must have had like crayons <laughs> or Braille or something. <laughs> maybe, maybe an audio book. I'm trying to figure out how this guy becomes a Muslim, a Muslim scholar. Um, I don't know an audio book. That's funny. Uh, here we go right now. Uh, this <laughs> 11 minutes and 59 seconds in, uh, insert the audible commercial. <laughs> Go ahead and put the audio commercial right here. Uh, Audible, if you're listening, actually, audio Audible used to. Mm, I'm not going to say that. They actually passed on doing commercials for the show. They were like, no, thank you. We heard your Nazi blowjob story, and we don't want to have any part of that. <laughs> uh, I got to focus on the agents. They had an agent on the inside that was like talking to the blind shake on a wire. And they got him talking about his planned bombing. 
And I think this is where the guy told the blind shake that the UN was one of the targets. And the blind shake was like, no, no, don't bomb the UN. The UN's full of good guys. <laughs> you know, uh, people that are sympathetic to us. So don't bomb them. If you bomb them, everyone will see us as an enemy instead of just, you know, just bomb the great Satan in the little war, Satan. He said, don't, don't bomb, don't, don't bomb that bomb something else. The law enforcement people at the time were like, hey, that makes them complicit, right? That makes him complicit. That makes them complicit. So they arrested his dirty ass and they put him in jail forever, but they didn't kill him like they should have. I don't know if this dude's still alive. He's never going to, he's never going to see the light of day. <laughs> That wasn't even a pun. I just didn't catch it. But across the world in the Philippines, there was a plot that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and Ramzi Youssef were connected to called Operation Bojinka, which sounds hilarious. But this Operation Bojinka was when a bunch, it's like a number of planes would blow up in midair simultaneously. So now they're, they're thinking of airplanes, you know. And these guys, they were starting to mess around and experiment with liquid explosives, you know, like the, that last good, the good, the last good Die Hard movie. Mm, it was the third one, I think, where they were like stuck in New York or whatever. But before he was like fist fighting airplanes. It's not that one. It's the one where Samuel Jackson's in it. Zeus. The bad guy had that binary liquid bomb. So, uh that it was like they had their finger on the pulse at the time because these terrorist assholes were experimenting with liquid bombs uh, at the time. This thing was big, the a 9-11 blueprint. So we start to see elements of 9-11, of the 9-11 plan starting to be thought about. Like they were the ones thinking about hijacking multiple planes instead of just one. Hijacking one plane was old hat by 1993. You know, we'd already been through the 70s at that time. Instead of going like, hey, fly me to Cuba so I could be with my fucking shitty communist brothers or whatever. They're like, you know, they're like these planes over to blow them up. <laughs> now, uh, they also had a big hang up on doing a bunch of stuff simultaneously. They wanted to kind of prove how organized it all was. So we're going to get into that in a minute. But uh, they were just like, we're going to take, you know, two or three a uh, number of things and make a plan all at once. We're going to show them how organized we are. Also in the Philippines, there was a plot reveal where these guys were going to try to blow up the Pope. That's just a part of the story that I took. I literally stole that as one of the endings to my Jinji Hod book where they blew up the Pope. Um, graphic novel. Check it out on the website. Osama bin Laden authored two fatwas in August 1996 and February 1998. The 1996 fatwa was a declaration of war against America's occupying the land of the two holy places. And it whines and complains and moans of American activities in no numerous countries. It was uh, faxed to Arab language newspapers internationally, but particularly in England. The 98 fatwa signed by five people who represented specific Islamic groups who were identified as the World Islamic Front for Jihad Against Jews and Crusaders. <laughs> the Legion of Doom. Um, a fatwa complains of American military presence in the Arabian Peninsula, the blockade of Iraq, and American support for Israel. It purports to provide religious authorization for the indiscriminate killing of Americans and Jews everywhere. It appears in February 1998, and the embassy bombings followed in August. In February of 1998, uh, this fatwa, the February 98 fatwa, is the first known official order of the World Islamic Front. The fatwa calls for 
uh, quote, in accordance with the words of Almighty God, fight the pagans all together as they fight you all together, and fight until there is no more tumult or oppression. And there, and there prevail justice in the faith of God, unquote. The fatwa is widely regarded by terrorism experts as the founding document in the world Islamic front. The Legion of Doom. This is the only religious rulings bin Laden got into. Since we are putting 9-11 in context, it is worth dipping our toe into this topic. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but if you search for Osama bin Laden's secret masturbation fatwa, you are going to run into this article on foreignpolicy.com. In January, the U.S. government released 49 new documents seized in the 20, in 2011 from Osama bin Laden's compound in Abbottabad, Pakistan. I'll say it like Obama, Pakistan. Among these items, the fourth and final batch of the Bin Laden documents made public since 2012 is a letter addressed to a senior colleague in North Africa, which is on the now deceased Al-Qaeda leader raises a very special and top secret matter. It pertains to the problem of the brothers who are with <laughs> you and their unfortunate celibacy and lack of availability of wives. <laughs> I'm trying to not editorialize so much anymore, and I'm really biting my tongue for them in the conditions that have been imposed on them. And we pray to God to release them. And I wrote to Dr. al Wahari, and I consulted with Shayaka, who is Eb. Boo Yaha Yaha Ya Doctor Ah <laughs> Doctor Amen has written us his opinion as we see it. We have no objections to clarify to the brothers that they may in such conditions masturbate. Since this is an extreme case, the ancestors approved this for the community. They advised the young men at the time of the conquest to do it. And it has also been prescribed by the uh, legists when needed. When needed. Fucking put an underline that. And there is no doubt that the brothers are in a state of extreme need. <laughs> it goes on to say, in the immediate aftermath of 9-11 attacks, the uh, evolutionary biologist and world famous atheist Richard Dawkins, who is great by the way, poured scorn over the nation over the notion that the 19 hijackers were motivated by the thoughts of injustice. On the contrary, I was going to try to do my Richard Dawkins impersonation, but I don't have one. Uh, on the contrary, he insisted what they really wanted was to get laid, referring to the martyr's reward of 72 virgin brides. He claimed that the testosterone sodden young men, too unattractive to get a woman in this world, might be desperate enough to go for 72, uh, pri uh, 72 virgins in the next I'm going to skip ahead a little bit in this article. A more nuanced version of this argument holds that suicidal jihad violence is rooted in the sexual repressed, repressed atmosphere endemic across the Muslim world and in Muslim communities in the West. We see this. We talk about this over and over and over again. And both sexual activities outside the marriage remains taboo, especially... For women, not so much for livestock. Boo -doo -boo. According, <laughs> according to this argument, the stigma and barriers attached to premarital sex create frustration that in some men boils over into murderous violence. As Christopher Hitchens succinctly puts it in his anti-thelemic polemic, God is not great. Jihadi's problem is not so much that they desire virgins, is that they are virgins. This argument draws support from a rich reservoir of antidotes, antidotes, 
about jihadis and their ideologues. For example, the Egyptian thinker Syed Qutb, who is widely credited as a formative ideological influence over bin Laden, was notoriously disgusted by sex. Yet, few subjects so vigorously aroused his interest and fascination. In one of the articles he wrote about his experience studying abroad in the United States between 1948 and 51, he registered his revulsion at the, quote, American temptress, unquote, with her, quote, expressive eyes and thirsty lips, unquote, quote, round breast, full buttocks and shapely thighs and sleek legs, unquote. In the same article, he expressed his shock at a dance at a church where the atmosphere was so full of desire. Uh, the novelist um, Martin Amos contended that Quatib's sexual desire, which he was unable to satisfy, made him very afraid and also ashamed and discouraged him and turned his thoughts to murder. The so-called ringleader of the 9-11 attacks, Mohammed Atta, was also obviously sexually repressed. He willingly enlisted in a mission that would end his life and those of countless others. But he was terrified of women. I think he wore, didn't he wear mascara? The, pic, the pictures they always show of him looks like he wears mascara. I'm like, what? Did they pick this guy up on Forbes? Like, where the, where the fuck did they get this guy? <laughs> He was terrified of women, refusing to date them or to even shake their hands. In his will, he instructed that his body be prepared for burial by, quote, good Muslims, unquote, and that no woman was to go near it. Women for Atta, as for Katib, were dangerous and dirty. If you're lucky... <laughs> If you're lucky, they're dangerous and dirty. A source of sin and spiritual contamination. All right, we're out of the article now. Uh, this is actually why, in my book, The Jin Jihad, D-J-I-N-N, -N, Jihad, you can find it on abercast.com, uh, in, in the Dijin Jihad, the Abercast, or sorry, in the Dijin Jihad, the lamp that the genie is in at the beginning of the story is, looks kind of like a giant brass cock because these guys are so repressed. Also, the building that they wind up assaulting in that book looks like a big cock. So we might beat the dead horse at some point in time, but there is material out there if you want to search it out. By this time, Bin Laden's hanging out in Afghanistan, and uh, if a familiar face shows up, Dr. Al-Zwahari, Osama Bin Laden and Al-Zwahari sort of sit down, and they start to kind of, like, make plans to change the world. In August 7th, 1998, we're creeping up, everybody, we're getting close to the almost simultaneous bombings. Remember I mentioned that they had, they were obsessed with doing something simultaneously to prove how organized they were. Uh, the U S embassy, uh, they're bombing the U S embassies to take place one in Kenya and one in Tanzania. They are, uh, suicide bombers, 235, I think dead thousands wounded, mostly Kenyans and Tanzanians. Um, they were totally taken by surprise. We didn't know where this came from. We thought it was like, I said, they just kept warning us, but uh, they kept sending these fatwas, um, but they weren't like sending stuff to the White House. Like, hey, we're going to fuck your shit up. <laughs> they were, <laughs> would do this. Uh, they send, you know, these communiques to friendly newspapers uh, in the West. And they were like these Arab speaking Muslim newspapers in London and so forth. So the average American has no idea that this is all going on. We, you know, I mean, we can look at it and like the parallels of, you know, like the fake news business and stuff that we see nowadays and be like, yeah, well, okay, well, maybe it was always like that. <laughs> so the standard American, not like there's such thing as a standard American, all Americans are non-standard, uh, 
had never heard of Osama bin Laden or Al Qaeda at the time until almost all the way up to 9-11. People hadn't heard of this guy. So when the newspaper starts like putting up pictures of him, they're like, we're pretty sure this is the fucking guy who did it. Most Americans were like, wow, that's miraculous. How did they know who this dude is already? And what I'm saying is you have to put all this stuff in context when you're talking about it, because you get through this and he's already on the top 10 most wanted list. Um, he, uh, is not a stranger and was not a stranger to, he was just a stranger to most of us. This is only because we're not paying attention. Was he not, was he a stranger? He didn't. Uh, just show up out of nowhere one day and says, Hey, we need a scapegoat. Pick this guy up off the wall, grab his picture, uh, for me, put it up on the TV, which is the way a lot of people think it happened. They were already bombing us embassies. The good, they go into later, they fucking bomb an actual Navy ship, the USS Cole. Anyhow. Okay. Let's talk about the American response to all this. 13, um, 13 days later, President <laughs> William Jefferson Clinton tomahawks the shit out of these two empty camps. And it's going to wind up developing into an embarrassing habit of the Clinton administration. Um, what he did was he blasted, uh, blasted hundreds of dollars worth of enemy tents and shit with millions of dollars of missiles, all the while le uh, elevating Osama bin Laden to kind of like the rock star status of the Wahhabists, maybe even the whole Muslim world. And at the time they were still treating this as a crime. They, the Clintons always, I'm sorry, Bill al always treated this as a crime. He could not think out of the box where this is concerned. And we're going to see the crazy price that America paid for this. Just stick with me. At the time where uh, where we're still treating this as a crime, Clinton winds up flying hundreds of fucking get this. He sent hundreds of FBI guys to do investigations overseas uh, um, uh, to investigate what happened with these embassy bombings. And I guess if you were going to investigate them, you need FBI guys because technically it's our real estate. But in these two countries, but since they were our embassies or whatever. You know, it is also, this is also a staple of the Clinton administration is, is treating this as a crime, even though they were, these guys declared war on us. They were stuck in this symmetrical mind frame of the difference between a military action and a difference between intelli intelligence gathering um, activity and the difference between law enforcement. These guys did not understand the enemy. Some of them still don't. And they suffer. Well, a lot of them still don't. Or a lot of them understood them, and then now they're re-misunderstanding them. They suffer from a lack of imagination, a lack of context, a lack of reading the Quran and understanding it. These shortcomings didn't just set the table for 9-11. It set the table. It cooked the turkey. It poured the drinks. It made the dessert. The only thing that it didn't provide was the dinner guests. There is a general confusion between criminal investigations, military action, and intelligence gathering operations. And when we talk about this later in a little bit more depth, but the confusion and miscommunication all became greater and greater between these political investigations and intelligence operations, specifically because of Bill Clinton's political and legal problems. And I'm going to start talking about something that's known as Gorelick's Wall. Do you guys know what that is? Right after this, we're going to get into it. Learn more at abracast.com. Get bonus content by signing up for the mailing list. Get all that plus many exclusive episodes by supporting the show at patreon.com or subscribestar.com. Yeah, 
You know what I'm saying is, if it wasn't a criminal investigation, why is this guy shooting missiles into the desert everywhere? Other countries would make fun of us at this time. They're like, oh yeah, Uncle Sam's a mad bomber (laughs) and all of this. Don't mind Bill Clinton, he's just blowing up the middle of the desert. So CNN has something to talk about other than him getting his dick sucked by a chubby intern. You know what I'm saying? You got it right. So Bin Laden continues to plan their next move. While these FBI guys were there, they arrested someone who was a bomber. And he wound up being the bomber for sure. And they wound up getting a phone number out of this guy. And the phone number they got went to some little building in Yemen. I think in this building, it was just like the main line, like command center between Bin Laden, who is the financier, and like all the different agents that they have working out there. It's like a, how this fucking bomber knew what the phone number was. The reason I mentioned this is because it becomes important later. So Clinton goes on, on this wild missile attack, 70 something quote camps, unquote, were bombed. Pharmaceutical factories were bombed. Uh, He's blasting everybody but Bin Laden on all of these attempt to distract America from the old cigar and the intern maneuver. So this clown we're going to talk about, and this is one of the really bad actors in this story. Uh, He was in the White House at the time. He's this guy, Richard Clark. And he starts coming onto the scene, and he's like this White House counter-terrorist guy. And for my money, he should actually be in fucking, like, Leavenworth for treason. Making big rocks into small rocks, bro, for the rest of his fucking days. These, there are dozens of these instances where these guys call foreign governments. He calls, like, Jake and Jackie Stan, and he's like, Yo, homie, we got an asset right there who's on the ground, and he's looking right at Sheik a la peanut butter and jelly sandwich who happens to be in our top 10 most wanted list for bombing schools and fucking nuns with scimitars and shit. Can you go pick them up pretty please? And we'll be right there to pick them up from you. And when the agents show up and go to scoop him up mysteriously shake a la peanut butter and jelly sandwich, he gets away. Uh, it's, not the government of Jake and Jackie Stan that's to blame. It's this fool that's to blame for purposefully warning these people. He's trusting these governments for doing the right thing, but they're not doing the right thing. He did not understand the enemy. They would actually side with Sheik a la peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And they think that you're going to, (laughs) <laughs> you're fucking the big Satan. You're bombing the shit out of everybody. And I think that you're going to do your dirty work against one of our homeboys. Shake a la peanut butter and jelly sandwich. You had an asset on the ground looking at the shake. How much does a fucking bullet cost? Problem solved. We're going to hear a lot of more of this bureaucratic incompetence. And there's a lot more unintended unintended consequences as well. And there is a lot more of um, this fucking Richard Clark clown. I'm trying to keep my blood pressure down, bros. I'm trying. (laughs) I'm just going to slow it down. Breathe. Everything's okay. 16 months before 9-11, there's this big meeting of the Legion of Doom. We talked about the Legion of Doom before in Yemen. This is not the wrestlers, you know. This is not the what a rush hawk and animal. (laughs) This is from the Justice League. This is Lex Luthor, Solomon Grundy, Cheetah, Sinestro, Legion of Doom. So they are meeting in Yemen, and this building... Uh, in this building where we have this phone number and they are uh, talking about uh, that belong to the, the one bomber, uh, the FBI, the CIA, the Keystone cops, the three stooges, constable, big Mac are all wandering around with their thumbs up their asses because there's this massive communications breakdown. And now you're like, how can there be a massive communications breakdown? The government's this whole big well-oiled machine 
Well, I'm going to tell you in a little while why there was a massive communications breakdown. However, right now, you just have to trust me, bro. Trust me that there was a massive communications breakdown. Like a Led Zeppelin magnitude. It happened because this event went off. These members of the Legion of Doom, Lex Luthor, the Joker, the Riddler, Sinestro, Cheetah, Solomon Grundy, fucking Mirror Master, Captain Cold, they were all there, and no one fucking did anything about it. Larry, Moe, and Curly were like, hey, isn't today the Legion of Doom, that Legion of Doom meeting was supposed to happen? And Constable Big Mac was like, oh shit, I didn't even send anybody. (laughs) And right next to him was Richard Clark going, oh yeah, uh And there was a sad trombone sound. So at this time, also members uh, of the uh, hijackers start showing up in the U.S. And is this another case of bureaucratic incompetence? Is this another unintended consequence? This flight school, there was this flight school mystery in Venice, Florida, where um, these hijackers were being trained. The CIA was running this little tiny airstrip out of Venice, Florida. Right next to the airstrip was a flight school running (laughs) up to 40 or 50 percent of the students that are going to take place. They were going to fly the planes on 9-11. The students were Arabs in this flight school. And it's this bureaucratic incompetence. Nah, bro. They were just dudes with box cutters. How could you think that they had anything? They had... <laughs> in 2001, a CIA agent is handed a file or a brief about a terrorist cell in Brooklyn. We are familiar with this terrorist cell. With, uh, it, but this file actually had a fucking picture of Mohammed Atta. And there was this thing called Able Danger. So you guys that are like, my phone isn't listening to me. No one's spying on me. Everything is fine. This is back in 2001. Uh, the CIA had this thing called Able Danger. And it was part of this big data. They call it big data. And... um there was a big data gathering program where this computer was like collecting all this data and actually discovered these guys just by looking at their data. So thanks Google. Thank, thanks Google. I appreciate that. <laughs> and all you people over there, are like, I don't care if Google is watching me. Well, I'm not doing anything wrong. Think about this shit and figure out what they can figure out about you. Like, what kind of fucking deodorant you wear? You know what I'm saying? To market it to you. <laughs> you, um, it's all a marketing ploy. Anyhow, fucking picture Mohammed Atta. Uh, he was one of, he was like the boss on the ground. And months before 9-11, the CIA was handed this guy and his cell to the FBI. This brief told them that they were operating members of Al Qaeda. They were making efforts in America. That they were affiliated with the Brooklyn cell and the Al Farouk mosque. And they were, uh, who was responsible for the 1993 bombing of the world trade center because these individuals were here legally. The CIA could take no action or alert the FBI. Is this bureaucratic incompetence? I don't know. Is this unintended consequences? Hmm. I don't know. Pay attention to the word legally. They were here legally. The, the CIA couldn't do anything to investigate them further and they couldn't alert the FBI. Do you know why they couldn't alert the FBI? I don't know. I don't know why I'm going to tell you why (laughs) I don't understand all this bureaucratic incompetence, these, uh, unintended consequences. I don't know. I'm going to tell you why. October 2000, off the coast of Yemen, one of the most sophisticated destroyers in our Navy, DDG-67, the U.S. coal, was uh, taken out by a suicide bomber in a raft. Let that shit sink in for a fucking second. A raft. This fucking guy paddles a raft up to the boat and blows it up. (laughs) They didn't blow up the whole boat. They blew a 50-foot wide hole in it. And wound up killing 17 Marines, dozens of others wounded, and it seems like some sort of bureaucratic incompetence right there, doesn't it, right? So around this time, Clinton orders the CIA and military in the military to finally kill bin Laden. And they they do. 
They find him. They find him eight to ten times. They find him, and then they go, hey, Bill, hey, President Clinton, we got this guy. He's in our sights. Can we kill him? And Bill goes, no, no, just leave him alone. I'm worried about the legality of it. I mean, this is a law enforcement issue, unquote. He's still tied up in this fucking thought that this is a law enforcement problem. And this is not an act of war. I'm fucking sorry. 17 Marines are dead. <laughs> Your fucking embassies are being bombed. How is this still an, a, a legal problem? This To me, this is not hindsight. I remember when this was all going down. I'm old, right? Remember? So, um... When I heard about the coal, I was like, all right, let's get busy. And then nothing happened. You know, they sent some FBI guys to be like, yep, okay, they blew a fucking hole in our boat. <laughs> we'll investigate this fucking hole. <laughs> with the, we'll investigate this book. This uh, boat has got a giant fucking hole in it. And that's what they do. They send the FBI guys to look at a fucking hole. And the president is like, ah, I didn't know the legal the legality of killing this guy who blew a forty foot hole in my favorite boat and killed a bunch of my dudes. So Clinton passes on killing Bin Laden eight to ten times. So we're going to detail these times, but I should mention that if you sign in to the degree of the Fulgor Correspondentia this month, um, I took the liberty of creating an infographic on hitting each and every single one of these points. If you want, if I'm going too fast or you want to maybe just see, it's funny. It starts at 1683 and it's like dot, 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 dot. And as it gets closer to 2000, it's like dot, 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 dot. It's interesting. I suggest if you want to check it out, he, Clinton just refused to kill this fucker. He had the chance eight to 10 times on record. The secret service guy that carried the briefcase that had the nuclear button in it. They call it the football. Uh, he carried the football for Clinton. He wrote a book explaining. He was like, yeah, there was a sniper in this thing and he was aiming at him. And Bill Clinton wouldn't even take the call from JSOC who was dealing with the operation. They said, we have them in our sights and we need an answer within five minutes. And Clinton was like, anyhow, how do I get to this fundraiser? <laughs> All right. So let's talk about this Grillix wall that I, that I mentioned before the break. Remember it's just mere months away from nine 11. It's the summer of 2001 deputy attorney general and also future member of the nine 11 commission. I'm sure that's not corrupt at all, by the way. <laughs> This lady named Jamie Gorillick sent a memo to CIA and FBI limiting their collaboration leading up to 9-11. It was this policy uh, we've talked a lot about here tonight. The administration was using a mix of law enforcement, intelligence gathering, and a military to combat this terrorist threat. Intelligence, law enforcement now is even more limited in their, their possible collaboration. Remember what I said when Angel Day... Able Danger was able to make the connection between this Brooklyn Al Qaeda cell. Um, it was because these individuals were here legally. The F or the CIA could take no action to alert the FBI. Gorelick's wall is why this memo, the CIA and the FBI limiting their collaboration. Traditionally, the CIA and FBI, uh, they have this thing called the Chinese wall for a long time, but this is just to protect CIA agents, uh, or their sources from legal prosecution from the FBI because the CIA hires a lot of shitty fucking people because that's the people that are in the environments where the CIA works. Uh, for the FBI, <laughs> where it's just like these guys, they had the, the FBI, you know, uh, he's in there and he's making their bombs and he's in the warehouse in Brooklyn. This is that Salam guy, uh, who was posing, um, with them. Uh, he had a, f for, as far as the FBI is concerned, they had that Salam dude who was embedded in the cell with the Alfred mosque. He was embedded with, 
um, the blind shake. He was he was making their bombs. You know, he was making their bombs. He's in this warehouse in Brooklyn uh, for this Day of Terror thing, and the fear was that the C- if the CIA had this guy's number, they might try to use him or whatever. But since the Joint Terrorism Task Force and the FBI were handling him, so you know it it breaks it up. It makes sure that they're not competing for, you know, these assets or this information or whatever. So there is the agents not fucking each other over accidentally. So this Chinese wall had been in effect for a long time. However, this Gorelix wall is entirely different. I found a great article about this from the Washington Times. And this article is called Jamie Gorelix Wall, April 15th, 2004. I would like to read you some of it if I can. And here it goes. The disclosure that Jamie Gorelick, a member of the September 11th Commission, was personally responsible for instituting a key obstacle to cooperation between law enforcement and intelligence operations before the terrorist attack raises disturbing questions about the integrity of the commission itself. Mrs. Gorelick should not be cross-examining witnesses. Instead, she should be required to testify about her own behavior under oath. Specifically, commission members need to ask her about the 1995 directive she wrote that made it a little bit more difficult for the FBI to locate two September 11th hijackers who had already entered the country by the summer of 2001. On Tuesday, Attorney General Ashcroft uh, declassified a four-page directive sent by Mrs. Gorelick, the number two official in the Clinton Justice Justice Department. On March 4th, 1995, the FBI Director Louis Free and Mary Jo White, uh, a New York-based U.S. attorney, investigating the 1993 World Trade Center bombing in the memo, Gorelick ordered free and white to follow information sharing procedures that go beyond what is legally required in order to avoid any risk of creating an unwarranted appearance that the justice department was using foreign intelligence surveillance FISA warrants instead of ordinary criminal investigation investigative procedures in an effort to undermine the civil liberties of terrorism suspects. It's funny, there's speculation. Actually, what she was trying to do was stop this, the, um, the collaboration between Clinton and the Chinese through, oh, what's the fucking guy's name? The Lippo Group. And there's a guy associated with it. You know, this is how the Chinese got nuclear secrets and all this stuff is they were basically selling them to them. And this is the reason why Grelick when I say they were selling it to them, what I meant is the Clintons were selling it to the Chinese. This is actually why Gorelick's wall went up. I'm not saying that's what went down. I'm saying that's a theory, yo. It's a theory. And it's true. (laughs) At issue was the off-noted wall of separation that prevented counterterrorism agents and federal prosecutors from communicating with one another prior to September 11th. Information collected under special FISA warrants, which do not require probable cause, was generally not to be shared with personnel responsible for enforcing federal criminal laws where probable cause must be demonstrated for a warrant to be issued. This is all Donald Trump collusion nonsense. This is how they were able to get warrants, FISA warrants to tap his campaign. Yeah. 
where probable cause uh, must be demonstrated for a warrant to be issued. As lawyers David Rivkin and Lee Casey noted on our opted our op ed page yesterday, the practical effect of the wall was that counterintelligence information was generally kept away from the enforcement personnel who were investigating Al Qaeda activities. But Ms. Gorelick's memo clearly indicates that the Clinton administration had decided as a matter of policy to go even beyond that law's already stringent requirement in order to further choke off information sharing. Mr. Ashcroft noted during his testimony before September 11th commission, all of this had a devastating effect into the investigation of Al Qaeda operations in this country in the summer of 2001. For example, in late August, when the CIA told the FBI that Khalid Al Mahedar and Nawaf Al Zahemi had entered the country, FBI investigators refused to permit criminal investigators with considerable knowledge about the most recent Al Qaeda attacks to join the manhunt. Also, a criminal search warrant to examine the computer of Zakawakis Mussolini, <laughs> or, uh, whose interest in flying aircraft had attracted attention. But it was rejected because FBI officials were afraid of breaching Gorelick's wall. Uh, Mrs. Gorelick has been among the most partisan and aggressive Democratic panel member in questioning, I wonder why, the anti-terror efforts of the Bush administration. The nation deserved a full accounting from Gorelick of why the Clinton administration felt it necessary to go the extra mile in order to hamper the uh, capability of law enforcement and intelligence agents uh, to talk to one another. I just explained it to you. Uh, if Mrs. Gorelick fails to provide this, her actions would bring into serious doubt the credibility of the commission. Well, guess what? This was written in 2004. I'm here to tell you, 2019, she never explained it. I just explained it to you. Anyhow, it was never given. She never went under oath. She never explained herself. So that's what I'm saying. Bureaucratic incompetence? Question mark. I don't know. Unintended consequences? For sure. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I don't know if it was unintended consequence. I, I can speculate that it is. I will. I mean, I don't want to hear this stuff. I'll tell you what it is. It's all about this massive Clinton crime incorporated. I mean, the Clintons were selling China nuclear secrets through the Lippo group. James Riotti was the dude's name. Backdoor nuclear deals to Korea. Actually, this is why we're having to deal with Korea right now, by the way. Uh, they are uh, uh, Clinton, Hillary Clinton, Bill Clinton, Sandy Berger, and this fucking Richard Clark fucking clown. They are the reasons we have to deal with all this shit right now, still to this day. So in our timeline, we all know what happens next. And that'll be on Friday. I'm John Towers. This is the Abercast. Learn more at Abercast.com. Get bonus content by signing up for the mailing list. Get all that plus many exclusive episodes by supporting the show at patreon.com or subscribestar.com. Uh, nine, this is the third 9 11 in context episodes. So, the last two episodes, we kind of went from the beginning um, of the ending of the Islamic Caliphate about 334 years ago at the gates of Vienna in 1683, all the way up to September, uh, 2001. I kind of decided to annex this episode a little bit. Um, because even though I wanted you guys to have an out, like if you didn't want to listen to all, you know, <laughs> all the blame Clinton stuff or whatever, then you just don't have to listen to this episode. Um, you can still get tons of great information from the last two episodes and you don't really have to get into this with me tonight. But this is, um, that is 
what this episode is going to be about. It's going to detail the huge amount of liability that Bill Clinton, Sandy Berger, Richard Clark, and Jamie Gorelick all have on uh, for 9-11. So there you go. There's your fucking trigger warning. We're, and this isn't like, this is, I've, um, the featured books for this series have been Michael Scheuer's, uh, book, Bin Laden, uh, Bin Laden. It's also, um, one of the featured books also include losing Bin Laden, how Bill Clinton's failure unleashed global terror and the straight up nine 11 commission report. And also there was this like super huge documentary called the road to nine 11, which, uh, I also watched. So, um, we're attempting to show that nine 11 wasn't just a few guys rolling out of bed, grabbing box cutters and changing the world. Like I said, this is my pet peeve with these nine 11, uh, truther dudes, these conspiracy theorists, you know, when they're like, you know, wizards knocked the building down as part of a ritual to bring forth transgenderism, <laughs> right? Those buildings represented Boaz and Yakin and like the Masons had something to do with it. You know those buildings were wired to explode, bro. Or it was a directed, a fucking invisible laser shot those buildings. Actually, I just believe that some crazy Muslims did this. And the conspiracy dudes, they're like, oh, you really believe the story? You know, where they're just these 19 guys can just do this with box cutters? So... <laughs> I've extensively said in these three episodes that we've been talking about this massively big combinations of the right people, the combinations of the right places and the combinations of the right frames of mind and circumstances. We're kind of shedding some light on this wild rash of quote, bureaucratic incompetence, unquote, this sort of phenomenon that allows people like the blind shake of visa and lets them st- lets them somehow insanely into the country once he gets out of an Egyptian prison for murdering an Egyptian prime minister or stuff like the CIA, knowing that Al Qaeda members connected to a Brooklyn terror cell are enrolled in flying lessons in Florida and not being allowed to tell the FBI about it. Things like knowing where Osama bin Laden is and having snipers on him in their scopes and not green lighting or assassinating him before all this stuff started. Or knowing where bin Laden is hiding and then notifying other Muslim countries. So instead of picking them up, they could go ahead and get him out of harm's way. So that's pretty much a recap of what we've talked about. Um, now we're going to kind of back up, rewind and talk about and examine more in the late 90s. This uh, is the Clinton era. And we're going to pull sort of pull apart or look at why 9-11 was actually allowed to happen. So I guess at the beginning of this whole thing, I was like, it was not an inside job, but we're going to see that uh, insiders had a lot to do with it. Not in a false flag sense of a way, just in a not understanding the enemy sense of sense of a way. Having one of these uh, rainbows and unicorns sort of sense of it, not not understanding is what I'm saying. So I have a couple things also that I need to talk about. Uh, I mentioned in the last episode that, uh, the steel, you know, this stuff about steel melting and I never really circled back on it. So uh, what you're talking about is a massive structure. You know, the tallest structure is, I don't know, maybe the empire state building by a couple of feet or the world trade center was taller than the empire state building by a couple of feet. Anyhow, this thing is enormous. Um, you know what happens. You can just do th- uh, this physics experiment in your brain. It's like this mental experiment. Um, I wasn't great at science in school, um, but I'm sure I'm going to be wrong or at least wrong about some of this stuff. So f- please feel free to reach out and tell me how big of a dipshit I am uh, or how wrong I am. But we all know that energy is not destroyed. It's only transferred. So if you have this vat of acid and say you have this big spring and you condense the spring down 
So all the potential energy in is in the spring. The spring has all this energy. We know that if you're holding it and you dip the spring into this vat of acid, as it dissolves, the acid melts it. It melts the spring. Where does that potential energy go? It's not being destroyed. So where does it go? So, I mean, think about it for a second. Well, you want me to do another one? Uh, all right. Well, before we get into this, I'll do one more. Everyone knows that there was no plane crash in Shanksville, right? It's just like a hole. There are no parts of a plane. It's an inside job, right? It was a missile. Well, I don't know. I think the guys that investigate airplane crashes say this sort of thing because every crash they've ever investigated, people who were in control of the plane were trying to stop the plane from crashing into the planet. You know, at Mach, whatever these fucking planes fly at. So slow the plane down as much as possible to do an emergency or a crash landing. So zooming into the ground as fast as it was flying disintegrated a large portion of the plane. This is the same reason we don't see wing impressions at, at the at the Pentagon. You have the same fucking problem. Everyone's used to looking at airplane crashes that people are trying to stop from crashing. Not ones that people have the pedal to the fucking metal. <sighs> Oh, okay. So if you're wondering what happens to the spring and the acid, this is what happens. The temperature of the acid rises proportionately. Now, you know, there is a lot of, or it's significantly, I don't know, it depends on like the vat of acid, I guess, or whatever, but it's kind of uh, how big the spring is, I guess. The point of the matter is that we're dealing with these giant structures that the weight sitting there has got a lot of potential energy in it with gravity and just how fucking heavy the building is. And when you start knocking floors down or running fucking airplanes into them, <laughs> you know, uh, who, um, who knows what's going on with that? You know, uh, do I think that running an airplane full of jet fuel into a building is enough to knock it down? Yes. Yes, I do. So there you go. All of you space guys and your satellites with laser, invisible fucking laser beams and all this. You might be listening to the wrong fucking podcast right now, but come back, you know, come back uh, when we talk about wizards and stuff. I, we'd love to have you back. This just might not be the podcast for you. So, okay. So if you guys are playing at home, now is the time I would like you to summon your vessel of the art and mix up your favorite weapon of mass distraction. Mine, rightfully so, happens to be a Jin Jihad this evening. And, um, yeah. And join me with toasting to the supporters of the show, the fellow craft and above supporters, the members of the degree of Fulgar Correspondentia, um, in, uh, Patreon or Subscribestar. Here is to you. Thank you, fine people. All right, let's go. Uh, a lot of this stuff comes ri from Richard Minter's book called Losing Bin Laden, How Bill Clinton's Failure Unleashed Global Terror. It also comes from this guy, Dr. Michael Scheuer, in his book. We're going to talk about him later. He was this the head motherfucker in charge of the CIA unit to find bin Laden. I think he ran it from 96 to, I don't know, whenever. So he's actually like a real outspoken dude. And he's kind of like this firebrand. Not a whole lot of people like him, especially Richard Clark. And my thing is, if Richard Clark doesn't like you, then I'll probably like you because I do not like Richard Clark at all. Uh, it's important to note that before Bill Clinton's inauguration, the CIA started collecting a ton of data on Al Qaeda. So let's get some context here, shall we? President Clinton gets sworn into office January of 1993. The World Trade Center gets bombed in 1993. The CIA was collecting all this information, so the Clinton people said, okay, well, you got to give all this stuff over to the FBI. And this is what I think is a huge problem, as I mentioned in the last episode, is that Bill Clinton had this point of view that this was a legal issue or a law enforcement problem. This was not an act of war. Even though bin Laden had stood up 
He's holding press conferences and he's sending communiques saying that this is a, you know, this Muslim tradition, like you have to declare war, you have to give your enemy time to convert to Islam or whatever. And the decision was made to arrest bin Laden, fly him here and put him on trial. I mean, <laughs> imagine putting bin Laden on trial. Imagine the pro the propaganda that would be uh, churned out from a situation like that on uh, in the running up to 2000, they were targeting vessels of war like the USS Cole. The Cole got blasted. 18 fucking Marines died. Dozens of people injured. And there are these national security advisors in the left ear of the president going, yeah, I don't think an attack on a destroyer, you know, is enough for us to retaliate. Are you fucking kidding me? Uh, I know everyone's like hindsight is 2020, bro. But when this shit was popping off in the 90s, like the Cobar Towers and the USS Cole, um, the one thing that Bill Clinton did do is he established this bin Laden unit. Uh, he put this guy, Michael Scheuer, in, ch in charge. I'm actually just going to go ahead and get into some of this actual 9-11 commission report. Remember, he had his <laughs> this thing packed. He had it stacked up. It had people like Jamie Gorelick. He had all these acolytes and stuff on the commission. They're there protecting him. And uh, we're going to talk about that when we get done with all this 9-11 uh, commission report stuff. We're going to go through a few of these when people are being nice and they're saying, quote, missed opportunities, unquote. I like to, I like to call the, quote, failed opportunities, unquote. I just want to do one quick note. The responsibility of the, of 9-11 falls on the fact that Al-Qaeda was allowed to grow and prosper. And the decision was made not to take out their leader when the chances existed to do so not once, but four times, according to the nine 11 report, president Clinton has acknowledged that as a regret. This was Marco Rubio on his remarks on NBC's meet the press, February 14th of 2018. So we, uh, he Rubio, Rubio calls out four times, according to the nine 11 report. I, picked through the 9-11 report and I found way more than four times. So I don't know what, I don't know what report Rubio was looking at. I presume. So we're going to talk a lot. Well, a little bit more, uh, than, than four of them. <laughs> we'll talk about the ones that I found some data on quite a few, many of them, uh, uh May, 1989 Tarnak farms. There was this, uh, a plan to raid the Tarnak farms that got rejected a compound of about 80 concrete. Uh, I'm just going to read it. I'm, I'm not going to summarize it. I'm just going to read this uh, thing. Hold on. These are from this. These are from the nine 11 commission report, Bill Clinton and the missed opportunities to kill Osama bin Laden. 2016, a compound of about 80 concrete or mud brick buildings surrounded by a 10 foot wall. Tarnak farms was located in an isolated desert area on the outskirts of Kandahar. CIA officers were able to map the entire site, identifying the houses that belonged to bin Laden's wives and the one where bin Laden himself was most likely to sleep. Working with the tribals, they drew up plans for this raid, and they ran two complete rehearsals in the United States during the fall of 1997. Early 98, planners at the counter-terrorist center were ready to come back to the White House to seek formal approval. One group of tribals would subdue the guards in her Tarnak farm, stealthily grab bin Laden and take him to a desert site outside Kandahar and turn him over to a second group. The second group of tribals would take him to a desert landing zone. From there, a CIA plane would take him to New York, an Arab capital, or wherever he was to be arraigned. Briefing papers prepared by the counter-terrorist center acknowledged that hitches might develop. People might be killed. And bin Laden supporters might retaliate perhaps taking U.S. citizens in Kandahar hostage. I mean, I don't know why that, I don't even know why this is part 
of the report that this is the name of the game when you're talking about special forces operations. But the briefing papers also noted there was a risk. It, there was a risk in not acting sooner or later. They said bin Laden will attack us interests, perhaps using weapons of mass destruction. The CIA planners conducted their third complete rehearsal in March. The plan had now been modified so that the tribals would keep bin Laden in hiding for up to a month before turning him over to the United States, thereby increasing the chances of keeping the U.S. hand out of sight. On May 18, CIA managers reviewed a draft memorandum of notification, which is a legal document authorizing the capture operation in 1986, presidential finding had authorized worldwide covert action against terrorism and probably provided adequate authority, but mindful of the old rogue elephant charge, senior CIA uh, managers may have wanted something on paper to show that they were not acting on their own. Discussion of this memorandum brought to the surface an unease about paramilitary covert action that had become ingrained, at least among some CIA senior managers. Despite misgivings, the CIA leadership cleared the draft memorandum that sent it on to the National Security Council. May 20th to 24, the CIA ran final graded rehearsals of the operation spread over three time zones, even bringing the personnel from the region. The FBI also participated. The rehearsal went well. The counterterrorist center planned to brief cabinet level principals and their deputies the following week, giving June 23rd as the date of the raid. With bin Laden to be brought out of Afghanistan no later than July 23rd. On May 20th, Director Tennant discussed the high risk operation with Berger. This is Sandy Berger, one of the bad actors in this story, and his deputies. Warning that people might be killed. Well, you got dudes running around in guns kidnapping people. Yes, someone might be fucking killed, including bin Laden. Success was to be defined as an exfiltration of bin Laden out of Afghanistan. A meeting of principals was scheduled for May 29 to decide whether the operation should go ahead, but the principals did not meet. The plan was never presented to the White House for a decision. Working level CIA officers were disappointed to capture uh no capture plan before 9-11 ever again attained the same level of detail and preparation. The tribals reported readiness to act dis diminished and bin Laden's security precautions and defense became more elaborate and more formidable. So if you're like, hey, I thought this was all about Clinton, not saying it and you just read that this plan was never even put up to the White House. It was put up to the White House. It was put up to Richard Clark, who call who called it off the the thing is about the administration it's about the the mindset of the people in charge that's why i said uh richard clark was the guy who pulled the plug on this and and he stated these reasons um he was like no i mean people could have gotten hurt <laughs> Yeah, people could have gotten hurt. So before we, before we get into the next one, I just want to say something that you might have picked up listening between the lines here. <clears throat> so Richard Clark has a track record for calling and notifying these foreign countries that we know that bin Laden is in their country. He, We're going to hear it over and over again in tonight's episode. So um, what we, what we just heard was that Richard Clark pulled the plug on this, on this operation. And then towards the end, we found out that Osama bin Laden started upping his security and making it more elaborate and more formal. I would like to venture a theory on how Osama bin Laden knew to up his security and make it more formal since Richard Clark is the one that pulled the plug on the operation. That's not in the report. Uh, it's details like this that makes me think 
<laughs> makes me wonder why Jamie Gorelick was on the 9-11 commission, though. So August 1998, a campaign continued airstrike is shelved after Al Qaeda attacks two embassies in Africa. The day after the embassy bombings, Tenet brought to a principal's meeting intelligence that terrorist leaders were expected to gather in a camp near Kawawast, Afghanistan, to plan future attacks. According to Berger, Tenet said that several hundred would attend, including bin Laden. The CIA described the area as effectively a military can cantonment away from civilian population centers and overwhelmingly populated by jihadists. <laughs> well, we might pull the plug on this. We don't want to hurt anybody. The principals quickly reached a consensus on attacking the gathering. The strike's purpose was to kill bin Laden and his chief lieutenants. Berger put in place a tightly compartmented, uh, compartmented process designed to keep all planning a secret. On August 11th, General Zinni received orders to prepare detailed plans for a strike against the sites in Afghanistan. The Pentagon briefed President Clinton about these plans on August 12th and August 14th. Though the principals hoped that the missiles would hit bin Laden, the NSC staff recommended the strike whether or not there was firm evidence that the commanders were at the facilities. Later on, on August 20th, Navy vessels in the Arabian Sea fired their cruise missiles. Although most of them hit their intended targets, neither bin Laden nor other terrorist leaders were killed. Berger told us that after action review by Director Tennant concluded that the strikes had killed 20 to 30 people in the camps, but probably missed bin Laden by a few hours. Where was Richard Clark? <laughs> During the last week of August 1998, officials began considering possible follow-on strikes. Bill Clinton was inclined to launch further strikes sooner rather than later. August 27, under the, sec uh, the Secretary of Defense for Policy, Walter Slocum, was advised Secretary Cohen that the Available targets were not promising. The experience of the previous week, he wrote, has only confirmed the importance of defining a clear, articulated rationale for military action that was effective as well as justified. But Slocum worried that simply striking some of these avail available targets did not add up to an effective strategy. Eventually, the discussion became mired in the, bureau in the bureaucracy and went nowhere. Hmm. There's our old friend, bureaucratic incompetence, again raising its ugly head. All right, the next one. August 1998. Covert operations limited to capture operations, not kill. President Clinton signed a memorandum of notification authorizing CIA to let its tribal assets use force to capture bin Laden and his associates. CIA officers told the tribals that the plan to capture bin Laden, which had been turned off three months earlier, was back on. The memorandum uh, also authorized the CIA to attack bin Laden in other ways. Also, an executive order froze the financial holdings that could be linked to bin Laden. The next one, December 1998, missile strike against Kandahar rejected. Memo to kill bin Laden misunderstood. On December 20, if... Intelligence indicated that bin Laden would be spending the night at the Hajj Habash house, part of the governor's residence in Kandahar. He's sleeping in the governor's house in Kandahar. An urgent teleconference of the principals was arranged. Principals considered a cruise missile strike to kill bin Laden. One issue they discussed was the potential collateral damage, the number of innocent bystanders who would be killed or wounded. General Anthony Zini 
predicted the number of well over 200, and he was concerned about the damage to a nearby mosque. The senior intelligence officer on the joint staff apparently made a different calculation, estimating half as much collateral damage and not predicting damage to the mosque. By the end of the meeting, the principals decided against recommending to the president that he order a strike. Later intelligence appeared to show that bin Laden had left his quarters before the strike would have occurred. Where was Richard Clark? On December 21st, the day after principals decided not to launch the cruise missile strike against Kandahar, the CIA leaders urged strengthening the language to allow the tribals to be paid whether bin Laden was captured or, or killed. The new memorandum would allow the killing of bin Laden if the CIA had the tribals judged that capture was not feasible, a judgment it already seemed clear they had reached. <laughs> the Justice Department uh, lawyer who worked on the draft told us that what he envisioned was a group of tribals assaulting a location leading to a shootout. Bin Laden and others would be captured if possible, but possibly would be killed. The administration's position was that under the law of armed conflict, killing a person who posed an enemy threat to the United States would be an act of self-defense, not an assassination. On Christmas Eve 1998, Sandy Berger sent a final draft to President Clinton with an, exp an explanatory memo. The president approved the document because the White House considered this operation highly sensitive. Only a tiny number of people knew about the memorandum of notification. A message from Tenet to CIA field agent directed them to communicate to the tribals the instructions authorized by the president. The United States preferred that bin Laden and his lieutenants to be captured. Why? What? But if <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm getting exasperated. Uh, but if a successful capture oper operation was not feasible, the tribals were permitted to kill them. The instructions added that the tribals must avoid killing others unnecessarily and must not kill or abuse bin Laden or his lieutenants if they surrendered. Finally, the tribals would not be paid if this set of requirements was not met. Policymakers in the Clinton administration, including the president and his national security advisor, told us the president's intent regarding covert action against bin Laden was clear. We, he wanted him dead. That's not clear to me. This intent was never well communicated, not after reading the whole rest of the thing. That doesn't make any sense. Someone is lying. Tenet told the commission that uh, except in one specific case, the CIA was authorized to kill bin Laden only in the context of a capture operation. CIA senior managers, operators, and lawyers confirmed this understanding. We always talked about how much easier it would have been to kill him, a former chief of the bin Laden unit said. Well, we're going to see. They had their chance. <laughs> I'm going to do this. Hey, stick around. I'll be right back. Learn more at abracast.com. Get bonus content by signing up for the mailing list. Get all that plus many exclusive episodes by supporting the show at patreon.com or subscribestar.com. Early 1999, decision not to deploy the AC-130 gunship option. After the decision in which fear of collateral damage was an important factor, not to use a cruise missile against Kandahar in December 1998, Shelton and officers in the Pentagon developed plans for using an AC-130 gunship instead of cruise missile strikes. Designed specifically for the Special Forces, this version of the AC-130 known as Spooky, can fly in fast or from high altitudes undetected by radar, guided to its zone by an extraordinary complex electronics. It is capable of rapidly firing precision-guided 25, 40, and 150-millimeter projectiles. 
Because the system could target more precisely than a salvo of cruise missiles, it had a much lower risk of causing collateral damage. Here we go. After giving White House official Richard Clark a briefing and being encouraged to proceed, Shelton formally directed Zini and General Peter Shoemaker, who headed the Special Operations Command, to develop plans for an AC-130 mission against bin Laden's headquarters and infrastructure in Afghanistan. The Joint Chiefs prepared a decision paper for deployment of the Special Operations aircraft. Though Berger and Clark continued to indicate interest in this option, the AC-130s were never deployed. Clark wrote at the time that Zini opposed their use, and John Mayer, the Joint Staff Deputy Director of Operations, agreed this was Zini's position. Zini himself does not recall blocking the option, because someone is lying. Where is Richard Clark? He told us that he understood the Special Operations Command had never thought the intelligence good enough to justify actually moving AC-130s into position. Shoemaker says, on the contrary, he thought the AC-130 operation was feasible. So we can mark this one up to what? I don't know, bureaucratic incompetence? What a phenomenon. February, March, 1999. A decision not to strike bin Laden's desert camp. What is this? Number four, number five, I lost count. Early in 99, the CIA received reporting that bin Laden was spending much of his time at one of several camps in the Afghanistan desert south of Kandahar. Uh, At the beginning of February, bin Laden was reportedly located in the vicinity of Sheikh Ali Camp, a desert hunting camp being used by visitors from a Gulf state. Public sources have stated that these visitors were from the United Arab Emirates. That's red flag number one of why this didn't happen. Reporting from CIA's assets provided a detailed description of the hunting camp, including its size, location, resources, and security, as well as of bin Laden's smaller adjacent camp, because this was not in an urban area, missiles launched against it would have less of a risk of causing collateral damage to mosques. On February 8th, the military began to ready itself for a possible strike. The next day, uh, National Technical Intelligence confirmed the location of the description of the larger camp and shown the nearby presence of official aircraft of the United Arab Emirates. Red flag. But uh, the location of bin Laden's quarters could not be pinned down so precisely. The CIA did its best to answer a host of questions about the larger camp, the residents, and about bin Laden's daily schedule and routine to support military contingency planning. According to reporting from the tribals, bin Laden regularly went from his adjacent camp to the larger camp where he visited the Emirates, Emirates, the tribals were expected, (laughs) expected him to be at the hunting camp for such a visit, at least until mid morning of February 11th. No, no strike was launched by February 12th. Bin Laden had apparently moved on and the immediate, (laughs) the immediate strike plans became moot. Where was Richard Clark? According to CIA defense officials, policymakers were concerned about the policymakers were concerned about the danger that a strike would kill an Emirati prince or that uh, senior officials who might be with bin Laden or close by. The lead CIA official in the field, Gary Schroen, felt the intelligence reporting in the case was very reliable. The bin Laden unit chief, Mike agree, that's Mike Schuer that we talked about, uh, believe today that this was a lost opportunity to kill bin Laden before 9-11. This is the one that um, Richard Clark, in the documentary Road to 9-11, it's like this, I don't know, like five-hour fucking thing, uh, he actually admits to calling this country and being like, why is bin Laden there? (laughs) Then he ghosts. He actually admits to this on fucking camera. He admits to it. Why isn't that in the 9-11 report? 
Well, because Jamie Gorelick was there. That's why. I'm getting tired. I still have pages of this stuff, man. Uh, February 1999. The decision to again amend the covert action authorization, canceling the kill authorization of December and reinstating the capture language. In February 1999, another draft memorandum of notification went to President Clinton. It asked him to allow the CIA to give exactly the same guidance to the Northern Alliance as it had just been given to the tribals. They could kill bin Laden if successfully captured, if a successful capture operation was not feasible. On this occasion, however, Clinton crossed out key language he had approved in December and inserted more ambiguous language. This is a move of a fucking lawyer. This isn't a leader. This is a lawyer. No, this is trying to give himself an out. This is, it depends on what the word is, is. No one we interviewed could shed light on why the president did this. They should have interviewed me. I just explained it. President Clinton told the commissioner that he had no recollection of why he wrote the language. Bill, pick up the phone. Call me. I'll explain it to you. Later in 99, when legal authority is needed for enlisting still other collaborators and for covering a wide set of contingencies, the lawyers returned to the language used in August 98, uh, which authorized force only in the context of capture of a capture operation given the closely held character of the document approved in 98 and the subsequent return of the earlier language it is possible to understand how the former white house officials and the cia officials might disagree as to whether the cia was ever authorized by the president to kill bin laden it was manufactured confusion This is a bone of contention with the intelligence community and with all these White House guys like Richard Clark. And you find them in interviews going, yeah, we totally gave the CIA authorization to kill him. That's like the fucking first thing we did. And then it cuts to Michael Scheuer, who is in charge of the CIA bin Laden operation. He was like, no, they never they never did give us the authority to kill him. <laughs> in... Um, May of 1999, the decision not to do the missile strike on Kandahar. If this is like Nietzsche's eternal reoccurrence. Like we're just reading the same stories over and over and over again, just in different years. It was in Kandahar that perhaps uh, the last and most likely the best opportunity arose for targeting bin Laden with cruise missiles before 9-11. In May 1999, CIA assets in Afghanistan reported on bin Laden's location in and around Kandahar over the course of five days and nights. The reporting was very detailed and came from several sources. If this intelligence was not actionable, working level officials said that uh, at the time and today, it was hard for them not to imagine how any intelligence on, on bin Laden in Afghanistan would meet the standard. Communications were good. The cruise missiles were ready. This was our strike zone. The senior military officer said it was a fat pitch home run. He expected the missiles to fly. And when the decision came back that they would stand down, not shoot, this officer said, we all just slumped. Uh, he told us he knew of no one at the Pentagon or the CIA who would have thought this was a bad gamble. Bin Laden should have been a dead man that night. Working level CIA officials agreed. While there was conflicting intelligence reports about Bin Laden's whereabouts, the experts uh, discounted it. At the time, the CIA working level officials were told by their managers that the strikes were not ordered because the military doubted the intelligence. They worried about collateral damage. We might damage the mosque next door. Replying to a frustrated colleague, colleague in the field, the bin Laden unit chief, this is, I think, Michael Scheuer, 
having a chance to get Ben Laden three times in 36 hours and foregoing the chance each time has made me a bit angry. <laughs> the DCI finds himself alone at the table and the other principals basically saying, we'll go along with your decision, Mr. Director, then implicitly saying that the agency will hang alone if the attack does not get Bin Laden. They talk, they have stories about them just calling the White House and being like, can, can we do it? Can we do it in them, in the White House, not picking up their phone? I mean, that's, to me, that's crazy. Uh, the military officer quoted earlier recalled that the Pentagon had been willing to act. He told us that Clark informed him and the others that tended assessed the chance of the intelligence being accurate as 50, 50, everybody else is on board. Everybody else is saying like, this is it. This is it. We're going to get him, except for Richard Clark. Who's like, eh, I don't know. This officer believed that Tenet's assessment was the key to the decision. Tenet told us he does not remember any details about this episode. Remember, imagine being involved in a decision like this and not remembering it. Except that the intelligence came from a, one single source, uncooperated, and that it was at a risk of collateral damage. Berger remembered only that in all such cases... The call had been tenants. <laughs> it's like a game of hot potato. Berger felt sure that tenant was eager to get Ben Laden in his view. In his view, tenant did this job responsibly. George would call and say, we just don't have it. Berger said, the, oh my God, Berger, the decision not to strike in May of 99 uh, may now seem hard to understand. Yeah. In fairness, we know, Two points. First, in December 98, the principal's wariness about ordering a strike that appears to have been vindicated. Bin Laden left his room unexpectedly. I don't think that's been vindicated. I want to know, I want to know who Richard Clark was on the phone with that day. If a strike had been ordered, uh, he would not have been hit. Second, the admin, he would not have been hit. There's a track record of Richard Clark knowing where he was and then him disappearing. Am I the only person that sees this? <laughs> the CIA in particular was in the midst of intense scrutiny and criticism by May 1999 because faulty intelligence uh, had just led the United States to mistakenly bomb the Chinese embassy in Belgrade during the NATO war against Serbia. The, this episode may have made officials more cautious than might otherwise have been the case. So you might think that I'm done. Oh no, brothers. I am not done. I have many, I have much more. <sighs> Depressingly much more. Uh, November, December, 2000. The decision not to strike against bin Laden after the Al-Qaeda attack on the U.S. coal. Back in Afghanistan, uh, bin Laden anticipated U.S. military retaliation. He ordered the evacuation of all Al of Al-Qaeda's Kandahar airport compound and fled first to the desert near Kabul, then to Noist, and then to Jalalabad, and eventually back to Kandahar. In Kandahar, he rotated between five and six residences, spending one night at each residence. In addition, he sent his senior advisor, Mohammed Atef, to a different part of Kandahar, and his deputy, Ayman al zwahari to Kabul, so that all three could not be killed in one attack. In mid-November, as the evidence of Al-Qaeda involvement mounted, Berger asked General Shelton to reevaluate military plans to act quickly against bin Laden. General Hugh Shelton asked General Tommy Franks, the new commander of CENTCOM, to look again at the options. Shelton wanted to demonstrate that the military was imaginative and knowledgeable enough to move on an array of options to show the complexity of the operation. He briefed Berger on the infinite resolve strike option developed since 1998, which the joint staff 
and CENTCOM had refined during the summer into a list of 13 possible possibilities or combinations. CENTCOM added a new phased campaign concept for wider ranging strikes, including attacks against the Taliban. For the first time, these strikes envisioned an air campaign against Afghan a stand of indefinite duration. November 25th, Burger. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> All the bad actors in one sentence. On November 25th, Berger and Clark wrote President Clinton that although the FBI and CIA investigations had not reached a formal conclusion, they believed the investigations would soon conclude that the attack had been carried out by a large cell whose senior members belonged to Al-Qaeda. Most of these involved had... Uh, trained in Bin Laden, Bin Laden operation camps in Afghanistan. Berger continued, so far Bin Laden had not been tied personally to the attacks and nobody had heard him directly order it, but two intelligence reports suggested that he was involved. Nearly a month later, on December 21, the CIA made another presentation to a small group of principals on the investigative team's findings. CIA briefing slides said that their preliminary judgment was that bin Laden's Al-Qaeda group supported the attack on the coal based on strong circumstantial evidence tying key perpetrators to the attack to Al-Qaeda. CIA listed that key suspects including Nashiri, in addition, the CIA detailed the timeline of the operation from mid-99 preparations to the failed attack on the USS The Sullivans on January 3rd, 2000, through a meeting held by the operatives the day before the attack. This, President Clinton and Berger told us, was not the conclusion they needed in order to go to war. They're not going to war to deliver an ultimatum to the Taliban threatening war. The election and change of power was not the issue, President Clinton added. There was enough time if the agencies had given him a definitive answer, he said, he would have sought a U.N. Security Council ultimatum, because we all know that works out just perfect. And given the Taliban one, two, or three days before taking further action against both al-Qaeda and the Taliban, but we did not think it would be responsible for a president to launch an invasion of another country based on preliminary judgment. No attack was launched, and one angry official rhetorically asked of the defense officials, does Al-Qaeda have to attack the Pentagon to get their attention? So this <laughs> defense official, I, I have a feeling it's Michael Scheuer. <clears throat> so that's all enough of this 9-11 report. I think it really sheds some light on it, especially if you're kind of paying attention to like what's in between the lines here. It's one thing to have this stuff in a report that no one reads. Obviously, no one reads it. I mean, I'm not a genius, but I was able to find this stuff in there. Um, but I had this whole thing here about this. It's like a five-hour-long TV miniseries in 2006. It was called The Path to 9-11, and it was based on this 9-11 commission's report. This thing is so damning to Bill Clinton that Harry Reid, who wasn't, he's not in the picture anymore. Thank you to the people of Nevada. Uh, and Chuck Schumer and these clowns threatened Disney slash ABC's broadcasting license if they played it. I found the letter of the letter that they sent to Bob Iger. Uh, here's a few gems. I'm not going to get into, I have this whole spiel about it, but I'm not going to get into the whole thing. So here's this letter. This is. <laughs> The United States government threatening Disney. We write with serious concerns about the planned upcoming broadcast to the path to 9-11 miniseries on September 10th and 11th. Countless reports from excerpts on 9-11 who have viewed the program indicate numer numerous and serious inaccuracies that will undoubtedly serve to misinform the American people about the tragic events surrounding the terrible attacks of that day. 
Furthermore, the manner in which the program has been developed, funded, and advertised suggests a partisan bent. Imagine Disney being partisan towards the right. <laughs> I mean, this is just laughable. Partisan bent uh, unbecoming of a major company like Disney and a in ma- uh well-respected new or- news organization like ABC. We therefore urge you to cancel this broadcast to cease Disney's plans to use it as a teaching tool in schools across America through Scholastic. Presenting such deeply flawed and factually inaccurate misinformation to the American public and to children would be a gross miscarriage of your corporate and civic responsibilities to the law, to your shareholders, and to the nation. This docudrama was based on the 9-11 report. I mean, let it sink in. The Communications Act of, this is in the, this is part of the letter. This is, they're basically threatening to pull Disney's broadcast license. The Communications Act of 1993 provides your network with a free broadcast license predicated on the fundamental understanding of your principal obligation to act as a trustee to public airwaves in serving the public interest. Nowhere in this public interest obligation more apparent uh, then in the duty of the broadcasters to serve the civic needs of a democracy by promoting an open and accurate discussion of political ideas and events. Now let that fucking sink in for a second. <laughs> um, They go on to say, to quote Steve McPherson, president of ABC Entertainment, when you take on the responsibility of telling the story behind such an important event, it is absolutely critical that you get it right. Unfortunately, it ap- this is the government. Unfortunately, it appears Disney and ABC got it totally wrong. Despite claims by your network that the representatives that... The path to 9-11 is based on the report of the 9-11 Commission. The 9-11 Commission themselves, Jamie Gorelick, as well as other experts on the issues, disagree. And here's what two superstars from our story have to say about the path to 9-11, despite the snippets of the actual report that I just read to you. Can you guess which ones I'm going to read? I bet you can. I bet you can fucking guess it. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Richard Clark, the former counterterrorism czar and national security advisor to the a- to ABC, has described the program as deeply flawed and said the program's depictions of a Clinton official hanging up on an intelligence agent it's 180 degrees from what happened. The 9/11 miniseries is criticized as inaccurate and biased. New York Times. Let that sink in. September 6, 2006. All right, this is the last bit, and then I'll let you go for the evening. This is the this is the second superstar who weighed in on this <laughs> on this Disney movie. As a 9/11 commission member and so much more. Jamie Gorelick said, it is critically important to the safety of our nation that our citizens in particular, our school children understand what actually happened and why so that we can proceed from a common understanding of what went wrong and act with unity to make our country safer. So I'll leave, I'll leave you with that. And I'll just say, What I always say at times like this, I'm John Towers and this wraps up our exhaustive to me, at least it's exhausted. I'm exhausted. I recorded these three episodes back to back to back. So I need a couple of days to dry out. If you know what I mean, this has been our exhaustive look at nine 11 and this has been the Abercast. And, uh, I want to just thank all, all the supporters. I just want to thank you for your support. Thanks a lot everybody 
And just thank you listeners for just listening. And uh, here's Hilla to tell you everything else. Thank you for listening to this episode. Send an email or visit us on social media to let us know what you think about this topic. And please remember to leave a five-star rate and review. Hey, did you learn something? Did you laugh? Supporting me is a way for you to be a part of the Abercast and ensure its growth and sustainability. It also means I can create a normal schedule for shows and bonus shows, as well as the exclusive fellow craft episodes. By supporting the show, you are not only a listener, but you are a part of the show. You supporting the show gives me a way to offer fun rewards as a thank you for showing your appreciation and support for our projects. Do you have an idea for a reward that you don't see? Let me know. My supporters are my partners. I currently pay for you to listen to the Abercast. Not only do I pay the hosting bills out of my own pocket, I volunteer my time and uh, talent to each and every episode of the Abercast. The price of books, the time and resources of reading and researching, the massive amounts of gin and tonic needed, the equipment it takes to record the shows, the time and resources it takes to create the bonus material, and the cost to maintain the internet presence. Is it worth your support? I don't know. I am proud of the Abercast, and I feel like I'm improving all the time. In addition uh, to creating the show that you dig... And that you are excited about, I also have a full-time commitment and other obligations. So why financial support? All of the supporters help me focus my time in on the quality and development of the podcast. And what if you can't afford, you know, one dollar or three dollars or ten dollars or whatever a month? Believe me, I get that. There are many degrees of support, but if you can't support the show financially, please consider leaving a five-star rate and review on your preferred podcast app. And don't forget that you could sign into the mailing list and still unlock a lot of bonus content. Thank you. I cannot put into words how much it means to me that you listen to the show each time I post a new episode. Your feedback, support, and love of the stories that we talk about here is what keeps me going. 